All right, engineers, in this video, we're gonna go ahead and talk in part three of the mechanics of breathing, all right? So if you guys are here, thanks again for sticking in there with us. We just really wanna make this stuff make sense. All right, so if you guys remember, we left off talking about what happened during the inspiration process. And if you guys remember, really briefly, to quickly recap that, at the end, um, at the peak point of inspiration, what was the pressure inside of the intrapleural cavity? If you guys remember, well, we called it the PIP. If you guys remember, we denoted it as negative four millimeters of mercury during rest, right? So it was negative four millimeters of mercury during rest. Then what happened? When we inspired, the actual thoracic cavity volume increased and the pressure decreased. What did it decrease to? If you guys remember that the intrapleural pressure, let me fix this here, the intrapleural pressure, all right, it dropped down to negative six millimeters of mercury. And this was during inspiration. It was that peak point of inspiration. So it dropped down, if you guys remember. Then we said not only did this change, let's show this arrow here, that this is, is what is actually how it changed. It went from at rest negative four to negative six during the inspiration process. Then what happened to the intrapulmonary pressure? Well, the thoracic cavity volume increased so the lungs started to expand, right? What happened? the visceral pleura was pulled, pulled closer towards the parietal pleura, if you guys remember. Thoracic cavity volume increases, the actual lung volume increases, so the intrapulmonary pressure should decrease. But originally at rest, what did we say it was? We said at rest, the P pole, which we denoted it as, was zero millimeters of mercury, right? In comparison to the atmospheric pressure, right? And then this was at rest. But then at the peak point of inspiration, what do we say? We said it actually thoracic cavity volume what? The thoracic cavity volume increase, so the intrapulmonary pressure should decrease. What do we say it was during that actual process? We said it changed to about what? Negative one millimeter mercury. So this was at during the inspiration process. But that wasn't it. Remember we said that because the atmospheric pressure, if you guys remember, the atmospheric pressure was actually what? 760 millimeters of mercury. And if you guys remember, how can we rewrite these numbers? So you know how we say zero millimeters of mercury? Doesn't that mean that there's no difference between that and the atmospheric pressure? So it's actually 760 millimeter mercury here. But over here, it's one less than the atmospheric pressure. So it's 750, nine millimeter mercury, right? So there's a pressure difference. What do we say? We said that the air would flow in actually right into the alveoli until the pressure in the alveoli equaled the pressure in the atmosphere. So it would rise, right? So at the peak point of inspiration, what would it convert to? We said at the peak point of inspiration, it would switch and it would actually allow air to keep flowing into the alveoli until the intrapulmonary pressure, which was 759 or negative one, same thing, went back to what it was out actually in the atmosphere. So what should the P pull be at the end point of inspiration? it should go back to zero millimeter of mercury, which again, if we rewrite it in terms of this, it would actually be 760 millimeter mercury, okay? So that's what happened there. Now, one more thing before we move into expiration is if you guys understand something real quick, this is what happens during quiet inspiration. So this, all these events that we just talked about here, this was occurring during quiet inspiration. Why am I mentioning that? Because you know there's what's called forced inspiration. I mean, think about it. If I'm just sitting here just normally breathing, I'm not really putting a lot of effort into it, right? But if I really wanna take some air in, let's say I really wanna take some air, I'm getting ready to like, I don't know, lift something really heavy, and I wanna get some air going into me, right? I take as much air in as possible. That was a little bit more forced. So a forced inspiration doesn't just involve my diaphragm and my external intercostal muscles, if you guys remember, because they were the ones that were contracting and changing the thoracic cavity volume, and therefore the pressures. But you know there's other muscles involved. So again, in quiet inspiration, what muscles were involved in quiet inspiration? The muscles that were involved in quiet inspiration was the external, intercostals, and what was the other one? The diaphragm, right? The diaphragm was the big one that was actually one of the inspiratory muscles during the actual quiet inspiration. But whenever we have to forcefully inspire, we have to uh, pull in some accessory muscles. So during this forced inspiration process, let's write this one down, during the forced inspiration process, it requires some other muscles. You know um, the sternocleidomastoid? 
it actually connects to the sternum. And so it actually what helps when it contracts, it actually can help to pull the sternum out a little bit. You know, there's some other muscles too. They're actually here in the, the lateral side of the neck. They call them the scalenes, the anterior, middle, and posterior scalenes. They also are connected to the ribs, so they can help to pull up the ribs a little bit. And if you're a very well-developed uh, individual, you can have what's called the pectoralis minor. They connect to the third, fourth, and fifth ribs. So they help to be able to pull the ribs up just a little bit, okay? So they can play a role in a forced inspiratory process. So again, what were those muscles that I mentioned? Again, one of them was the sternocleidomastoid. We're just gonna write SCM, okay? The other one was the scalenes. And again, there was an anterior, a middle, and a posterior scalene. And then the third one was going to be, again, the pectoralis minor. Okay, well, why am I mentioning this? Because all it does is just gonna add on to this. So if you think about these guys, if these guys are involved during forced inspiration, what are they gonna do? I said that the sternocleidomastoid pulls the sternum out a little bit, so it helps to elevate that, pull it up a little bit and outward, so that increases the thoracic cavity volume. Scalenes also pull up on the ribs. Pectoralis also pulls up on the ribs a little bit. If that's doing that, what is it actually doing to the thoracic cavity volume? All of these things are working to do what? Their primary function is to do, all of these guys, increase thoracic cavity volume, even more than, than the diaphragm and the external costals are, do, are doing. So if that's the case, let's pretend for a second that those muscles contract. What's gonna happen to the thoracic cavity volume? It's gonna increase greater than normal. So what would you expect? So let's actually have another line here. Let's do this one in green first. Actually, no, let's do this one in this maroonish color. Let's say that this is during forced inspiration. So this is during forced inspiration. So it goes from here at rest. We take in a certain amount of air, but we go even more than that. Let's say that the intrapleural pressure decreases even a little bit more because the volume is increasing a little bit more. So the pressure should decrease a little bit more. So let's say it was negative six. Let's say it goes down to negative seven. You know, just suppose that it goes down to negative seven millimeter of mercury. And during, what is this during? This is during forced inspiration all right sweet okay same thing what about for the uh, people well we said it was at zero during rest okay well let's pretend for a second that we pull on those sternocleidomastoid scalenes pectoralis minor and we've taken a little bit more air and what's going to happen to the thoracic cavity volume it's going to increase so what should happen to the actual pressure inside of the actual alveoli it should decrease even more how much more should it decrease? Well, it decreased at negative one during quiet inspiration. Let's add one more negative point. So let's say it went down to negative two. So if that's the case, it goes down to negative two millimeter of mercury. And this is during forced inspiration. But again, you guys already know that whenever we reach that point of where there's a pressure difference between the alveoli, or the intrapulmonary pressure and the atmospheric pressure, what's gonna happen? Air has to rush in to equalize. So think about this for a second. This was a negative one. So compare this, 760 to 759. If this one drops down to negative two, what is that in this terms of 750 and all that stuff? This would be 750, eight millimeters of mercury. Who has a steeper pressure gradient? This one into 759 or this one into 758? Obviously 758. What does that mean then? More air is gonna flow down into the lungs until this pressure equals the atmospheric pressure until what? And we can show this arrow going back to this point here. So I can show it going right back to this point. Going right there, okay? So that should make sense. And that's why if there's a greater pressure difference, what does that mean? That means more air is gonna flow in. You know the relationship between that? If I don't leave you guys hanging, you know there's a relationship, it's called uh, specifically flow of gases is equal to the change in pressure over the resistance. So if you have a greater pressure difference, what's gonna happen to the flow? So if this increases, what's gonna happen to this? This will increase. There's a greater pressure difference. So what's gonna happen? More gas will flow in. That's the whole point. So whenever you're breathing in normally, versus I'm taking more air in. It's simple, right? Okay, so that's forced inspiration. Now here's the next question I wanna ask you guys. I wanna pose a question to you guys. I want you guys to think for a second. All right, so all these muscles are involved during the inspiration process, a lot of muscles. What muscles are involved in the expiration process? If you guys said any muscle, I want you to remember that's not correct. There is no muscles that are involved during the expiratory process. It is completely passive. Why is it passive? I'm glad you asked, I'm gonna tell you. So you know our lungs are very elastic. So during expiration, now we're talking about quiet, we'll talk about force in a second, but we're talking right now about quiet 
expiration. So during quiet expiration, are there any muscles involved? No muscles involved. No muscles involved. Need you guys to remember that because it's a passive process. So again, what is it here? It's a passive process, so it doesn't require the activation of our muscles, our skeletal muscles, to contract. What does it depend upon? Let's write this in a super bright color. It completely depends upon the elasticity of the lungs. What is elasticity? Elasticity is this desire of a structure, in this case the lungs, to resist being stretched. In other words, it always wants to snap back. It wants to recoil and go back to the smallest size possible. Okay, and you can determine that because you know elasticity is equal to the change in pressure over the change in volume. So what happens if your volume decreases? Your elasticity increases. So you want the volume to decrease so that your elasticity can increase. So that's the whole goal here. That's what we want to happen. So how does this happen? Let's explain that. If you guys remember, we're not going to take a significant amount of time here. We're going to be pretty quick. Let me get this brown marker over here. If we have over here, if you guys remember, we have a structure here inside of the medulla. You know, this is the midbrain. This is the pons. This is the medulla oblongata. In the medulla, you have this specialized structure. It's a mixture of expiratory and inspiratory neurons. This structure here is called the VRG, the ventral respiratory group. Okay, so now you know that they're uh, from the VRG, there's coming these downward presynaptic neurons. They're sending these presynaptic neurons down to specific sections of the spinal cord, specifically in the ventral gray horn. In the ventral gray horn, you have these uh, somatic neurons, especially, especially around C3, C4, and C5. They actually send these axons out and they come out to the diaphragm, if you guys remember, right? So this was the phrenic nerve. And that was innervating the phrenic nerve. I'm sorry, that was innervating the diaphragm to cause it to contract and trigger the inspiration process. Then if you guys remember, if it came down even more, if I came down even more, I'm not gonna draw all of them. I'm just gonna do a couple of them. But you know that this is C3 to C5. This is T1 to T11. This is the intercostal nerves, right? And we'll draw the intercostal nerves in a different color. Let's do these in like a red color or something. No, 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 let's do them in green. So again, these right here are your intercostal nerves, right? And this would be T1 to T11, and you get that these guys would come up here and they would innervate what? The actual external intercostals, right? And cause those to contract. Whenever we start getting ready to expire, the whole point of expiration is there's no muscles involved. So we want to shut down these actual nerve impulses. We don't want those nerve impulses to keep sending signals. How do we do that? There's special stretch receptors inside of the actual bronchi and around the actual lung area that pick up that increase in stretch because of the inspire, inspiration process. And how our body deals with that, let's say that we have, here, let's draw a little stretch receptor out here. Look at him. He's sitting here and he's having his feet in here and he feels some actual stretching. So what he does is this stretch receptor, this is our stretch receptor, this little dude right here, and what he's going to do is he's going to pick up this stretch and he's going to send these signals into the medulla. We're not going to go over the mechanism right now. All we're going to say is that it inhibits the VRG, the inspiratory centers of the medulla. We'll talk specifically about the mechanisms in other videos, but for right now, just want you guys to know that the stretch receptors is sending inhibitory signals into the actual medulla, inhibiting these inspiratory uh, centers. And then if that's the case, what's going to happen to these action potentials coming down? They're going to drop. So the action potentials going down this actual axons is going to decrease. And if all of these action potentials decrease, what happens to the action potentials going to the diaphragm? It decreases. What happens to the action potentials going to the external intercostals? It decreases. If all of this decreases, what happens to these muscles? They relax. So if the external intercostal muscles, what happens to this one? It relaxes. Ah, it relaxes, right? It's like I'm done contracting. What happens to the diaphragm? It relaxes. He's like, oh, man, thank goodness, I get to relax. Now, what happens when these muscles relax? If you guys remember, what do we say about the diaphragm? Let's, let's show it, actually, oh, just show a small diagram right here. Let's say I do a small, real quick diagram, crude diagram. Don't judge me, guys. It's going to be a really quick one. And let's say right here, I have the diaphragm right here, right? So here's your diaphragm. If you guys remember, 
whenever the diaphragm was contracting, what was happening to the diaphragm? You guys remember, it was actually, it was actually depressing downwards, right? So because it was depressing downwards, what was that doing to the thoracic cavity volume? It was increasing it. When this relaxes, he goes back up. So now if you can imagine, what would happen then? This would go back up, and what would that do to the thoracic cavity volume? It would decrease the thoracic cavity volume. Well, what's that relationship with Boyle's Law? Okay, well I know Boyle's Law says that, well let's write that down. Boyle's Law says that pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So there is an in, uh, inversely proportional relationship between pressure and volume. If pressure increases, what happens to the volume? It decreases. If the actual pressure decreases, then the volume increases. You get the point. Well now, we said that we're bringing the diaphragm back up. So what should happen to the volume? It should decrease. Then what should happen to the pressure? It should increase. And that's what happens. Let's note that. So again, what happens here? When the diaphragm and the external intercostals contract, the thoracic cavity volume decreases. And then what does that do to the pressure? And therefore, the, the actual pressures would increase. And we're going to see how that's actually happening. OK, before we do that, let's see what the external intercostals do. Well, remember what they were doing. We showed you on the skeleton model, right? They were creating that, that bucket handle movement. They were pulling the ribs outwards and pulling the sternum outwards and forward, right? Upward and forward. That was the increase in thoracic cavity volume. If they relax, what's going to happen? They're going to recoil. They're going to come back down. The sternum is going to come back to this position. What's going to happen to thoracic cavity volume? It's going to decrease. And what's going to happen to the pressures inside of the thoracic cavity? They're going to increase. So let's see how those pressures are increasing on this diagram over here. OK, so now if we take where we were during this actual uh, inspiration process, let's write that down over it. Actually, no, we'll keep it and we'll, we'll show how it's happening over here. Right? So during the inspiration process, our intrapleural pressure was negative um, 6 millimeters of mercury. Right? Then what happens to this thoracic cavity volume? It decreases. So what should happen to this pressure? It should increase. To what point does that pressure increase? Well, as the diaphragm is going back up, and as the uh, ribs or the chest wall is recoiling, this intrapleural pressure should actually go up to about negative 4 millimeters of mercury, the original volume. I'm sorry, the original pressure. So what should that pressure now be? Where's my blue marker? This is actually going to be intrapleural pressure is equal to negative 4 millimeters of mercury. And this is during the actual change, during these change in the pressures, right? So now, whenever this actual volume decreases, the pressure should increase and it should go to negative 4 millimeters of mercury during the expiration process. Sweet, nothing, nothing too bad about that, right? Okay, so now, why is this pressure decreasing it? Because the volume, I'm sorry, why is this pressure increasing? Because the volume decreased. And the volume decreased because the actual chest wall was recoiling back. As the chest wall is recoiling back, also the diaphragm is doming up. And you know the lungs? They're trying to recoil because of the elasticity. They're trying to recoil. So they're trying to pull the visceral pleura away from the actual parietal pleura, right? But remember, these two layers are sticky to one another. So what does that mean? It's going to pull on the parietal pleura also. So when it pulls on the parietal pleura, it decreases the actual volume and increases the pressure. OK? But then. Interpulmonary pressure. OK, well, let's take a look at that. Originally, what was it? Well, let's come back and look at it real quick before we come over here so we don't lose sight of this. It was over here at approximately about 760 millimeters of mercury, or zero, right? Well, now we're, we're actually decreasing the thoracic cavity volume. So the pressure should increase. You know what the pressure actually increases to? It increases to approximately about one millimeter of mercury above. So it becomes positive one. So now the P pull. The intrapulmonary pressure should go to positive one millimeter of mercury. And again, how could we write that with respect to the atmospheric pressure if we compare it with that? What was the atmospheric pressure again? The atmospheric pressure was 760 millimeter mercury. This one is one above that, so it should be 760 one millimeter mercury. Huh. Well, now the pressure gradient difference is from here out there. That's the diffusion principle. Things like to move from areas of high pressure to low pressure. So where should the air go? The air should go out. 
out into the atmosphere where the pressure is lower. And how long will it actually keep doing that? It'll keep doing that until the pressure inside of the alveoli or inside of the lungs equalizes with the pressure in the atmosphere. And then there's no net diffusion, right? So now, let's say that that happens. Let's do this in pink. Let's show the change. So during the expiration process, so during this process, when the, the thoracic cavity volume is decreasing, right, this is what you're going to get. So this is during the actual beginning of expiration, right? So this is at the beginning point of expiration. But when the air is actually leaving, when the air is actually leaving, because when the thoracic cavity volume is decreasing, that's when the pressure increases. But then where does the air have to go? It has to go out into the atmosphere. So then the peephole will change and air will start flowing out until the intrapulmonary pressure equalizes with the atmosphere. So it should become zero millimeter of mercury. Or, again, how would you rewrite this? This would be rewritten as 760 millimeter mercury. And this is at the end of inspiration. So, I'm sorry, expiration. This is at the end of expiration. End of expiration. Because the moment when it becomes equal, there's no going to be no net diffusion. Because again, things like to go from high to low pressure. When it's equal, there's no net movement. It's at equilibrium. OK, so that's the process there. OK, so what things were contributing to this? If we remember, let's come back, review it, and then we're going to go into one last thing, and then we're done here. All right? What do we say? Quiet expiration, no muscles. It's passive. Why? Because of the natural elasticity of the lungs. It wants to recoil. When it recoils, it pulls the parietal pleura, right? I'm sorry, it pulls the visceral pleura away from the parietal pleura. But if you remember, those layers are sticky. So it's going to try to pull the parietal pleura with it. Not only that, but the chest wall is going to recoil. Why? Because the external intercostals are relaxing and the diaphragm is relaxing. So therefore, the thoracic cavity volume will decrease and all of those pressures will increase. Okay. But you know, our body has another way of dealing with when we need to get extra air. So if I'm just trying to breathe normally, I'm just trying to expire. So let me just stay here for a second and go. Just a normal. That's just a normal inspiration, expiration. But now, I want to breathe out. Let's say I'm doing abs. All right? I'm doing some abs. I'm trying to get that, you know, I'm trying to get more fingers than abs, right? And I, I'm sorry, more abs than fingers, all right? And I'm trying to contract my abs. If I do that, I'm going to exert, I'm going to try to breathe out as hard as I can. So I have to exert more effort. So if I have to exert more effort to exhale that extra air, it's going to require some extra muscles. So forced expiration does require muscles. Quiet expiration does not involve any muscles. So let's write that down. So again, what did I say? Forced expiration involves muscles. So what muscles would be involved in this? Primarily the abdominal wall muscles. So the abdominal wall muscles. So which ones? You know, like the, you know, it could be the external oblique, the internal oblique, and even the transverse abdominis, and to a little degree, the rectus abdominis, and to a little degree, the rectus abdominis. So you all can say the transverse, transverse abdominis, and a little bit of the rectus abdominis. Okay? So now, if these muscles are contracting, how, how, is this actually, how is this actually happening? There's one more muscle. I forgot. I'm sorry. One more muscle. It's called the internal intercostals. We'll talk about these and we'll say how this plays a role in this relationship. But what was the, what's the overall effect of these guys? Okay, let me explain the internal intercostals first because it's the easier one and then I'll explain the abdominal wall muscles. All right, so I wanted to bring in an actual skeleton model so we could go again. So we did with expir I'm sorry, we did with inspiration. Let's see how that works with expiration. So if you guys remember, here's our ribs right here, right? And if you guys remember, there was the muscles that were the external intercostals, right? And they were actually elevating the rib. Well, we have other muscles which are in between the ribs, which are called the internal intercostals. The only difference is, if you remember, the external intercostals were pulling the, up, the lower rib upwards. The internal intercostals will pull the upper rib downwards. When that happens, it pulls the actual ribs downwards a little bit more, 
And as it pulls the ribs downwards a little bit more and tries to push the sternum inwards, as well as trying to push the ribs a little bit more inwards, what happens to this thoracic cavity volume then? It would decrease. And just to give you a little bit more of an example, we'll bring this here chest plate here. And so you can see again, if you look, we're going to have, here's your ribs, and here's the internal intercostal muscles. And again, when they contract, they pull the upper rib downwards, depressing the actual rib cage. And by doing that, they decrease the thoracic cavity volume. Okay, so I just want to give you guys that as an example. So let me get back, get this out of the way, and we'll get back into this video. All right, so now that we know that, we know that the internal intercostals are actually helping to decrease the thoracic cavity volume. That was their main goal. So they're doing that. So let's write this down. Oh, fix my spelling here. Internal. I did it again. Internal intercostals. All right? Now, these are just designed to be able to decrease thoracic cavity volume. All right, sweet deal. Now, these other ones, let's explain how these work. So these are pretty cool. When they contract, the external oblique, internal oblique, transverse abdominis, and the rectus abdominis, when they contract, they, help to, they actually create a, a pressure. They increase the pressure inside of the abdomen. So it's called the intra-abdominal pressure, right? When that pressure increases, it pushes upwards, upwards and backwards on the diaphragm. So imagine here's the diaphragm right here. And the abdominal wall muscles are trying to push on the, this diaphragm in its actual resting state or this actual expiratory state, right? So it's, it's actually relaxing. I said the diaphragm is relaxing. But then the abdominal wall muscles contract and they increase the pressure inside of the abdomen and they start pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing. So imagine me yanking this diaphragm up. I'm yanking the diaphragm up. What am I doing to the thoracic cavity volume? I'm decreasing it. So I'm trying to push the diaphragm up to decrease thoracic cavity volume. What is that going to do to the pressure? It's going to increase the pressure. So let me write this down here with these guys. Again, what is the goal of all of these muscles here? All of these ones is to increase the intra-abdominal pressure, intra-abdominal pressure, which will then push on the diaphragm. And then when it pushes on the diaphragm, it actually does what to the thoracic cavity volume? It decreases the thoracic cavity volume. All right, sweet deal. Now, when that happens, let's say that the, the actual thoracic cavity volume generally, whenever the diaphragm was just normally relaxing and the external intercostals were normally relaxing, this pressure was negative four, right? And then this pressure went to what? Positive one, right? And then it eventually went to zero. Well, now we're going to decrease the volume even more. So now this pressure should actually go up a little bit more. It should actually even become a little bit more positive. Let's say, for example, and that this happens during the forced expiratory process. So during the forced expiratory process, what would we expect it to change a little bit from? Let's say that it changes to about negative three. Just suppose. Negative three millimeter mercury. So now it's even a little bit more positive. And again, this is during the forced expiration. And this is because the actual, this volume here is decreasing because the chest wall is trying to push inwards. And then also the diaphragm is trying to push upwards also. So the volume is decreasing, the pressure should increase a little bit more. With this one, it was actually positive one, right, during that expiration process. Let's say that we actually decrease the thoracic cavity volume even more, his pressure should actually go up a little bit more, maybe like plus two. So let's say, for example, that this one actually does increase. Let's say it increases to about plus two from the actual just normal expiration process. So we're just comparing them. This is negative four, negative three. This one will be plus one, this one should be plus two millimeter mercury. And this is during what? Forced expiration. Okay, why am I telling you this again? What is the atmospheric pressure? Let's write this out here. Atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeter mercury. Compare the differences here. 761 versus what is this? Again, if we rewrite this, what would this actually be written as? we could technically say this is actually 762 because it's a two above the normal atmospheric pressure. So 762 millimeter of mercury. 
compare 762 from 761. Which one is actually gonna flow out more? Well, this is gonna have more air to flow out. So this is gonna have more air. So more flow from this lung. And that's what explains during this actual forced expiration process why more air goes out. So more air leaves. Because why? The gradient here is two. The gradient here is one. More air will flow out until the pressure inside of the lungs equalizes with the pressure of the atmosphere, which should be what? It should go until it equalizes with the atmosphere. So the intrapulmonary pressure at the end of the force expiration should be zero millimeter mercury. Zero millimeter of mercury. And again, this should be at the end of forced expiration. And again, what is, if we just reiterate again, what is this 760, I mean, what is this zero millimeter mercury? It is just, same thing as writing, 760 millimeter mercury. All right, and engineers, we cover a lot of information in this video. I really appreciate you guys sticking in there with me. I hope all of this stuff made sense. I know it was a lot of stuff, I, and, I, and I hope it made sense now. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If it did, please hit the like button, comment down in the comment section, and subscribe. All right, engineers, as always, until next time.